Well, good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see all of your faces. Um, my name is Reverend Stephen Milton, as most of you know, and some of you don't. Um, and I've been away for the last three months on sabbatical. Um, I've been here at Lawrence Park for five years. That's why I got the sabbatical. It just, it's been a wonderful five years, and it was such a brilliant, wonderful gift to have a sabbatical. I've had lots of great adventures, which I'll be sharing with you one way or another, including uh, during today's sermon, where I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I was doing in August, where I was walking the Camino. So it's wonderful to see all these um, faces who I recognize, and we have some new people to introduce. We have a new Sunday school teacher starting today, Sarah Velez, um, and uh, we'll be saying au revoir to a couple of other people uh, during the service. So. Things are always in motion here at Lawrence Park, which is wonderful. Today is also the start of the season of creation in the United Church year. So for the next five weeks, we'll be celebrating creation, nature, and um, all its beauty and our need to care for it in various ways. Today, we'll be doing that mostly through music, as you heard with our lovely uh, first introit. Um, and over the course of the month, we'll be talking about nature from various different angles. So... Why don't we get started now by taking two deep breaths to settle ourselves for worship. So one, let it out, and another one, and let it out. We acknowledge that we are meeting on land which has been taken care of by indigenous peoples for thousands of years. They felt that there was no separation between human beings and nature. Indigenous people say that the trees, the rocks, the bugs, the birds, they are all their relations. And they have invited settlers, people from Europe and other parts of the world, to see nature in the same way. And of course, we don't. <laughs> uh, Western culture has told us that there's human beings and there's nature, two separate categories. And that has done enormous uh, damage to nature all over the world, climate change being the most obvious effect. So the indigenous perspective on nature, which is that we should care for nature as a mother who cares for us, as a relation, a relationship, an ongoing relationship, is one which could be beneficial to us. And so we acknowledge that indigenous peoples have been taking care of this land for thousands of years the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit have called this particular space home, and they continue to ask for reconciliation and recognition that their way of seeing the world is worthwhile. And now I invite you to rise as the choir rises to sing our first hymn.
There's a line in that hymn that says, God shines through all that's fair. It's a lovely thought. God shines through you, too. When we pass the peace of Christ and we say, peace be with you, we're looking into each other's eyes for seeing that light of God welling up through us. Think of yourselves all as stained glass windows through which light, God's light shines. So when you pass the peace, look into someone's face and know that God is in there too, and they see God in you. The peace of Christ be with you. Please pass signs of the peace of Christ to each other. I would like to speak to everybody today, not just the kids, because I would like to introduce our new Sunday school teacher. And can you just tap your mic to make sure you're on? Can we turn Sarah on? Uh, Hello. Oh. Yeah, it's got a green light. Oh, there we go. Excellent. Okay. So um, we have been looking for a Sunday school, Sunday school teacher for a while, and I'm so happy that we found Sarah. So Sarah, I just want people to get to know you a little bit. So... Where were you born? Um, I was born in Colombia, and my parents immigrated to Canada when I was seven years old. And it was a really, really big change, but the good thing about it is it gave me many different perspectives, right? So when you live only in one country, you only see things a certain way, the way that your culture teaches you. But because I'm from two different places, I see things in many different ways, in both the Canadian and the Colombian way, which is really good when, when making decisions and, and when thinking what to do. Okay, and what sort of church, if any, did you go to when you were a kid? Um, I'm not entirely sure. I know my mom did go to church, and um, I would always go with her, and whenever there was the service, I would always be with her, and we didn't have that Sunday school sort of thing, um, and my mom was always like, oh my goodness, sit, pay attention, <laughs> and I remember the pastor was like, oh, don't worry, even if a kid isn't looking at you, um, they're still listening. So we used to have these gum wrappers and I would always make little characters with them. Uh, and then I would just be randomly um, looking up at my mom and being like, did he say this? And she'd be like, yeah, he did, <laughs> right? So it's really cool to see the way that children work and that even if they look like they're not listening, kids are amazing at multitasking, right? <laughs> and um, have you taught kids before, like um, taught yes. Sunday school type stuff before? Um, so I've taught in many different places. Um, in terms of church, um, I did teach a church camp. It's called Seeds of Hope. And it was two months of simply focusing on the concept of trusting God. So we looked at many different parables, many different scriptures, and we saw how every single character in the Bible trusted God at some point. Right? And it was really cool to see. Um, I was there for a very long time. I would always be planning stuff. And my boss, um, she didn't do very much. So I would always be the one planning <laughs> everything. Um, but it was cool. It gave me those leadership skills that I needed. Right? Yeah. Should have gotten two paychecks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what are you doing this fall? Um, so I am in university. I am doing a degree and a diploma in visual and art history, and then I'm going to move on to do my master's of teaching um, at University of Toronto. Yeah. Okay, and awesome. I'm also teaching at an academy where I teach grade four English uh, for younger kids. Yeah, it's really cool. Wonderful. Well, we feel so blessed to have you here. We yeah. trusted in God, and we got you, which is yeah, a great way awesome. to be rewarded. So. Um, I'm going to invite you to take the kids up uh, to the Bradford room after the scripture reading. So thank you very much. Can we all give uh, Sarah a hand? Thank you. Thank you.
James 2, 1 to 17. Favoritism forbidden. My sisters and brothers, your faith in our glorious Savior, Jesus Christ, must not allow favoritism. Suppose there should come into your assembly a person wearing gold rings and fine clothes, and at the same time a poor person dressed in shabby clothes. Suppose further you were to take notice of the well-dressed one and say, sit right here in the seat of honor, and say to the poor one, you can stand or you can sit over there by my footrest. Haven't you in such a case discriminated in your hearts? Haven't you set yourselves up like judges who hand down corrupt decisions? Listen, dear sisters and brothers, didn't God choose those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom promised to those who love God? Yet you've treated poor people shamefully. Aren't rich people exploiting you? Aren't they the ones who haul you into the courts and who blaspheme that noble name by which you've been called? You are acting rightly, however, if you fulfill the venerable law of the scriptures, love thy neighbor as yourself. But if you show favoritism, you commit sin, and that same law convicts you as transgressors. Those who keep the whole law, except for one small point, are still guilty of breaking all of it. The one who said no adultery also said no killing. So even if you don't commit adultery, if you do commit murder, you still break the law. Talk and behave as people who will be judged by the law of liberty, because judgment without mercy will be the lot of those who are not merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. My sisters and brothers, what good is it to profess faith without practicing it? Such faith has no power to save. If any are in need of clothes and have no food to live on, and one of you says to them, goodbye and good luck, stay warm and well fed, without giving them the bare necessities of life, then what good is this? So it is with faith. If good deeds don't go with it, faith is dead. So as I mentioned earlier, this summer I had many adventures, and my adventure in August was to go on the Camino. I've walked part of the Camino before. Uh, once uh, I walked it from Porto up to um, its destination, Santiago, in just before the pandemic began. Actually, the same summer I started here, I walked part of the Camino. This time, though, I walked more of it, and I was walking it with my wife. And the Camino is a pilgrimage which has been uh, walked since the Middle Ages. And there's one route called the Francaise route, which starts in France, and you go up over the Pyrenee Mountains, a kilometer in a day. That's a lot of up. Um, and my wife and I decided to do that route. Uh, I said from the outset, I was only going to do the first half. So I'd be around 350 kilometers. I figured that was plenty. She wanted to do the whole thing, and she did, uh, 779 kilometers. And here's a picture of her at the destination. So there she is standing, uh, and standing, which is good, because your feet hurt by the time you get there. <laughs> so, and the place behind her, that's the actual destination that people do the Camino for, is to reach that particular cathedral. And it's the Cathedral of Santiago. In Spanish, Santiago means St. James, the exact same St. James who wrote our scripture reading today. And tradition has it that the bones of St. James traveled after he was killed in Jerusalem to, um, to Spain where they were buried on that spot, which is why they created a cathedral there. So the process of walking the Camino involves uh, walking with big backpacks on your back, 
um, quite heavy, well, not, hopefully not too heavy, about 10% of your body weight is the recommended. And you've got everything that you have in your knapsack. So you've got a change of clothes, uh, maybe some Crocs or flip-flops, so you have something to wear after you get out of your boots, which you'll want to get out of your boots by, <laughs> by the time you finish walking for the day. And we would walk about <clears throat> 20 to 30 kilometers a day. So someone asked me, you know, how many steps were you walking? Um, on the long days, the 30-kilometer days, that's 40,000 steps. So just to put that in context. And so you'd usually walk for about five or six hours and then stop um, in a hostel. And the way you knew where you were going is that there are these yellow arrows everywhere, painted onto rocks and painted onto the road and signs and stuff. So you don't worry about getting lost when you're doing the Camino. You know, just follow the yellow arrows and you'll be okay. After five or six hours of walking, though, you're done, and um, you want to stop. And there's fortunately, there's uh, hostels called albergues every uh, seven or eight kilometers. Thank goodness. This is definitely an old world activity. We could never pull this off in Canada, because, of course, we go hundreds of kilometers between towns once you get outside of places like the GTA. But in the old world in Spain, there are towns every seven or eight kilometers, so you can do this. So you walk about you know, 20 or 30 kilometers, depending on the terrain and how ambitious you are, and you get to a hostel. The hostels, um, uh, they're run by the local towns, and they're just basically a room full of bunk beds. So you're bunking with complete strangers, um, and there could be like 20 bunk beds in a room. And everybody arrives, they have a shower, they get out of the cl stinky clothes that they've been in, the boots are left outside or in a, in a separate room because they smell so bad that nobody wants them in the place where we sleep. And uh, so you get changed into your other pair of clothes, and then you have a very long lunch because usually there's nothing else to do, and you're really hungry. You burn a lot of calories doing this. Um, and the nice thing about staying in the hostels is you get to know the other people who are walking on the Camino. And after a few days, you find that you're, you tend to spend your time in the hostels with the same group of people because they're the people who walk at the same pace as you do. Right? Because some people are a lot faster and so forth. And most of the people that we were walking with were young Europeans. There were some people from China and Korea and Australia, but for the most part, they were young people from Europe. It's a cheap holiday. And <clears throat> you know, over the days, you know, both in the hostels and dinner and walking along the trail, you get to know people, and they ask you about your life and what do you do. And if people asked me, I would admit that I was a minister because I wasn't like walking with a collar on or anything. And it became very clear that most people were not doing the Camino for spiritual reasons. This might have been a religious pilgrimage long ago, but it isn't anymore. It's for young people. It's a cheap holiday. It's an adventure, it's a challenge, can I do it? Um, but very few people were doing it for spiritual reasons, and they weren't stopping at all the churches I stopped at. <laughs> uh, they were, you know, just there for a good time. But that didn't mean that spiritual questions didn't come up. They did. And once they found out I was a minister, they started asking me spiritual questions. And one day, we were walking along a dusty Spanish road in some farmer's field, and one of the guys who we had befriended asked me a question. He said, I know a lot of very nice people who are very caring and loving, who never go to church, and yet they do good deeds all the time. They're exactly the kind of people that church wants Christians to be, but they don't go to church. So... Is there anything wrong with what they're doing? Like, why bother going to church if they're already the right kind of people who are doing good things? So that was his question. And he said it had been bugging him for a while. So I gave him a short answer while we were walking along the trail. But I've been thinking about it since. And now I'd like to give you the longer answer. And I'll send this to him um, uh, so that he can finally get the full answer to, to his question. And... You know, the fact is, we all know people who are like that. We all have friends who seem to have been born with great big hearts, who delight in doing good things for other people, right? Who never go near a church, and yet you can see them volunteering in organizations, doing the run for the cure, participating on school board committees, you know, all sorts of good things. And they do it because they like to do it. 
right? They're not doing it out of duty. They just feel like doing it, so they do it. And that's wonderful. And we all... So it's wonderful that they're doing that. So what's the difference between them and churchgoers? Well, the problem is we don't always feel like doing it, right? We all have days where we're just, you know, too busy with whatever's happening in our lives, right? We feel stressed. Maybe we're rushing to get the kids or, you know, things aren't going well at work or just the world seems too much on some days. And so on those days, we don't spontaneously throw a coin into the beggar's cup. We don't do the nice thing which would be easy to do, like help someone cross the street. And it may seem like way too much of a bridge too far if someone asks us to serve on some committee at school. So we don't. And that's human nature, and that applies to everybody, right? Churchgoers and non-churchgoers. We all find life too much sometimes, and it sort of narrows the horizon of how much we can care about other people. That's natural. The thing is, though, for churchgoers, when we go to church on Sunday mornings, we are reminded that we are called to be loving even when we don't feel like it. Right? It's not just about when it feels good for us. We're reminded that we are made in love by God and we are here to share that love. In the Apostle John's first letter, he writes famously, God is love. The universe was made from and through God's love and we were made in God's image. Right? That's, you know, in Genesis it says God made us in God's image and you know, sometimes we think, oh, does that mean that God looks like a human being? No, that's not what that passage means. It means that God's qualities, God's loving qualities, have been embedded in us. So when we're born, we are born with a capacity to love other people, right? There are species who, as soon as that baby's born, they're kicked out of the nest or they're just left to, you know, go on their own. I, I came across a baby turtle the other day in High Park. Its mom had come up onto the beach laid the eggs, and then gone back to the water. Best of luck, son. Best of luck, daughter. We're not like that, right? We are born with the capacity to love our children and our friends and our neighbors. And yet, God also wants us to love all of God's children, which includes strangers and people who are not like us. And that sometimes feels like a bridge too far. That's the part we don't feel like doing. And there's nothing new about this. In the reading which Christina shared from the Apostle James, Jesus' brother by tradition, he says, I have noticed that when you go to church, when the rich come in, you give them the best seats. And when the poor come in, they have to seek uh, they have to sit at people's feet or sometimes in the back. You're showing favoritism for the rich over the poor. Now, picture this. They didn't have churches like this back when he was writing. He's writing in like the 50s, so 20 years after Jesus' ministry comes to an end. So they're uh, kind of a secret religion. They have to meet in secret, so they meet in people's houses. And the way they do it is basically it's kind of like a potluck dinner every time they meet. Everybody's expected to bring food. They have a common table. They meet in people's dining rooms. And they put all the food on the table. And everybody is supposed to be an equal around that table. Okay? The rich and the poor, the slaves and the slave owners, everybody is equal at that table. Men and women, everybody is equal at that table. That's the way it's supposed to work. But James says, I have noticed that it's not working that way in practice. You are showing favoritism. You're doing what society expects, which is to treat rich people as though they're more important than poor people. Now, James says, we have a choice here. We could present the values which God requires as a list of duties, like just the law. So don't murder, don't steal, 
don't treat people unequally. We could just make it a list, and you just have to check all the boxes. But of course, if you don't check every box, then you're not actually conforming to the list. So you've broken the law, and you're a sinner. So that's one way of looking at it. And he discourages people from seeing it that way. Instead, he talks about how Jesus has introduced something which he calls the law of liberty. And the law of liberty is where if you can be loving and treat people as equals, even when you don't feel like it, then you are actually getting closer to what God actually meant for you to be as a human being. You will be closer to your true human nature when you're helping others, even if on the surface you don't feel like doing it. So he's contrasting the law as a list to a law of liberty where if you do these things, treating people as equals and being compassionate, you will actually be liberated. Now, that doesn't sound very realistic. It sounds much more realistic to say, uh, if I don't feel like helping somebody, I'm being very true to who I really am. Right? This summer, in addition to walking the Camino, half of it, in June, I spent my time reading up on mind-body research, something I've been interested in for a while, and I finally had some time to actually delve into it. And as part of that, I wanted to look into the effect that going to church has on people's mental and physical health. Fortunately, sociologists and psychologists have been studying this for decades. So the results are no longer, you know, one wishful study or one wishful study there. No, there's like hundreds and thousands of studies that have looked at the effects of going to church on people who go to church compared to what happens to people who don't go to church. So the people who feel like doing good things but can opt out of doing good things when they want to because they don't go to church, and those who go to church who are told all the time that they should do good things. Two different populations. The church-going population, it turns out, on average, they smoke less, they get depressed less, they commit suicide less. In a study of... Uh, I think it was 15,000 nurses who were um, Christians and not Christians. They found that the churchgoers, over a 15-year period, they were more likely to be alive than the non-churchgoers. So going to church actually kept you alive in middle age better than not going to church. People felt less stressed, and if they were hospitalized and they went home after like a serious hospitalization surgery or whatever, they were less likely to feel depressed. And if they did get depressed, their depression lasted for a shorter period of time. Something about going to church is actually good for you. <laughs> it's not that it should be good for you. It actually is good for you. And it, will, it helps with your mental and physical health. And it doesn't mean that no one uh, who goes to church never gets depressed. They do, of course. And they get anxious. All those things are true. We're not like a different type of human being. But there's something about going to church which affects people and actually makes life easier. And this adds up. All these effects add up and lead to this, that people who go to church actually live longer on average than people who don't go to church. There have been many studies about this, and the most recent ones, this is one that was reported in the Washington Post, a major study of church attendance and mortality indicates that people who attend church every week live an average of seven years longer than people who never attend worship services. Seven years. It's pretty good. Wow. No wonder churches have so many old people in them. <laughs> <laughs> And if you're wondering, okay, but is it the effect of community? Is it because we've got, uh, you know, people in community? Of course, that's going to feel good. That's going to feel good. But wouldn't that also apply to my membership with the Bridge Club or my membership in book club groups or my membership to a health, uh, health club? They've controlled for that. No, there's actually a difference between churchgoers and those sorts of clubs. Something is happening here which is really good for people. 
which makes us better in terms of our well-being than other types of collective uh, groups. So scholars have wondered about this. What is it? And one of the things they've come up with is they argue that when you go to church, you are told and you sing and you pray a consistent message of we belong to something bigger than us. We belong to a cosmos which actually cares about us. Christians believe in a benevolent universe, one which cares, and that makes it easier for us to care for each other because we feel that we are simply walking in the way of the universe itself. Where love is, God is. So we feel encouraged to be loving to each other because that's just who human beings are supposed to be. Because we were given those qualities by God. And something about that approach, brothers and sisters, agrees with us. The results are in. Being loving to each other works. It can lengthen your life. It can make you feel better and make life's hardships seem a little bit smaller. When something bad happens in your life, you can go, oh, but I'm still part of this big, wonderful thing, as opposed to something bad happening in your life going, the sky has fallen because my life is only about me, which is often the temptation when you're alone and you don't feel connected to others and to the universe. I wasn't the only person on the Camino who was only doing a part of it. There are a number of us like that. And over the first two weeks, um, we often cooked dinner for each other. You know, these are a bunch of strangers who didn't know each other a week before, but we'd all come together and do these um, dinners together. And as people announced that, the, you know, today was my last day, I'd go home tomorrow, they would stand up and make speeches. And, you know, these are young people, under 40, and they said they were just so touched by the kind of community which they had experienced over these last couple of weeks that they said, I'm going to carry this Camino home with me. I didn't think this was possible. They were experiencing the power of love when people put away their differences and just cooperate. They were experiencing what James the Apostle said is the law of liberty, when you love the stranger, you will discover love in yourself and love around you. You will be surprised. And so I think let's celebrate good deeds and loving acts wherever they happen, whether they happen among people of faith or not. Let's always celebrate that because that's God rising to the surface through people. And even if it only happens a little bit, Let's smile and go, look at that. That's God's love right there. And let us celebrate that we come together week after week to share God's love and that message which agrees with us and makes our world and the world at large a better place. For we are not alone. We live in God's world who has created and is creating still. Amen. on a journey, fellow travelers on the road. We are here to help each other bear the mile and bear the load. Let me be your servant, let 
Light for you in the night time of your fear. I will hold my hand out to you, speak the peace you long to hear. I will weep when you. Let us pray. God of creation, you made this universe through love. You know the name of each star and each sparrow. In a universe of emptiness, you created gravity to draw matter together, to catch fire as stars, to build planets, to draw us together in loving embraces. All day long, birds sing to each other, sometimes to attract a mate, most of the time just to stay in relationship. I'm over here, where are you? You created plants whose love make, making blooms and flowers, filling the world with beauty. The love life of plants fills our gardens, sends seeds spiraling from the air through, from the trees, and graces the world with perfume. Loving God, we get so wrapped up in ourselves, we forget to see and feel the love that surrounds us. So on this first Sunday of the season of creation, we give thanks to you for the gift of nature. We give thanks for sparkling rivers and deep oceans. We thank you for the scary, starry skies above, the wonder of the Milky Way. We are grateful for trees, for vines and grasses, which adorn our lawns and feed us. We admit that we still mistreat nature, as though it is always a second thought, when in fact, According to scripture, you made nature first and humans last in the seven days of creation. We ask for your help to care for nature more diligently, for help to change our ways. And now I'd like to ask you all to look at the screen and read uh, the United Church's new creed together with me. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, 
to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now I'd like to just um, uh, talk about our announcements that we have, um, the things which are happening uh, this week. Um, meditation doesn't actually start this week. It starts next week on Monday. Uh, pole walking is on on Tuesday, uh, as is uh, Allison's coffee time. Uh, my prayer service on uh, Wednesdays at 3 starts this Sunday, uh, starts this Wednesday, rather, at 3 o'clock. Um, and Tai Chi will start not this week, but the following week. That's correct, right, Laura? Yep. Um, on September 29th, a few things to just uh, remember looking forward. Um, on the 29th, we will be having, that's the last Sunday of September, we'll having a blessing of the animals. So we did this last year, and people really liked it, so we're going to do it again. So please feel free to bring your pets uh, with you to that service. Dogs on leashes, cats in carriers, birds in cages, uh, snakes, however you carry them. Uh, <laughs> And if you've got an animal who is at home who you know will just freak out if they come here, you can bring a picture of them, and Reverend Roberto will bless them all. And stuffies are okay, too, for the kids. Um, the bell choir is uh, starting to meet on September 17th, um, and we need new bell ringers. So um, do you need a lot of musical experience to be a bell ringer, Daniel? <laughs> a pulse and an ability to move your hands and arms is all you need, apparently, to be a bell ringer. Um, and they do make a lovely sound. So if you've got Tuesday afternoons free, um, please uh, let come see Daniel, and he can uh, tell you more about how to ring the bells. And the choir is also looking for new members, so if you've got a voice that you would love to um, sing and share, please, please, please let him know. Now, um, we have a change in our ministry coming up. Um, Reverend Dr. Eric Bacon, our pastoral care minister, will be, uh, has decided to retire. And this time he means it. <laughs> so he is retiring as our pastoral care minister, and uh, he and Marilyn will be going to Australia in, in just a couple of weeks, and uh, they will be gone for most of the fall. So when Eric returns, he'll be our minister emeritus, which he was before uh, he became our pastoral care minister most recently. Um, and we would like to honor his ministry here by uh, having him come up to say a few words, and we have a little gift for you as well, Eric. So come on up. Good morning. Well, some of my friends here last week said, make sure you come next week as if you're retiring. So no suit, no tie, <laughs> no collar. I've taken the name off my door, but I still have it. <laughs> okay. Actually, if I'd have known I was gonna live another seven years, I would probably have postponed today. <laughs> but, but in any event, uh, this is for real. I've had lots of practice in retiring, and I'm, I think I'm getting good at it, and I want to make sure that this is for real, Stephen, although I may, I may bug you from time to time, okay? But on a more serious note, I came to ministry late in life, and I loved it, and I never wanted to leave it, and so hence, after five bypasses, I had a new life, and I'm very grateful for that. So I was able to come back and work along with Stephen and my friends and colleagues on the staff after having a previous five and a half years with John Souk. So I've been truly blessed here, and as I said, it was hard to leave it. This time I think I'm ready. Um, 
I think I have most of my faculties. You know I have a hearing problem, which does get in the way sometime. But I was really grateful, Stephen, for the last three months because I was able to remind myself that I can lead a congregation still at 82 years of age. So um, that was, thank you for going away. But, um, thank, <laughs> but thank you for coming back. And I'm glad you had such a refreshing time. So retirement as a minister, they say old soldiers fade away while well, old ministers just become a nuisance, okay? And I can assure you, Stephen, I won't become a nuisance. I will be a great supporter of ministry at this church and particularly uh, a supporter for our friends and colleagues in the staff. You have a wonderful staff in this church, believe me. I've been in a few places and this is really icing on the cake. But, um, Tomorrow I will be the same Eric, okay? All of a sudden I can't stop being pastoral, but I'll be your friends. We'll be back, this is our church. We found this church in 2013 and we realized what a wonderful, caring, welcoming, and now affirming church this is. And we all benefit from this caring community. And uh, so I have a few thank yous today. Now, first of all, thank you for the trust you placed in me, which has allowed me to be an effective pastoral care minister. There has to be trust. And I found that with you. Many of you I've walked with through difficulties and bereavement. That's a sacred trust. And I wanna thank you for placing that trust in me. To my staff, colleagues, and friends, we are indeed a family here as staff. We laugh together, we cry together, and sometimes, as I said to Michael the other day, we moan together. <laughs> but in any event, this is a close, we have a close-knit staff complement here who really work together and support each other. And I feel that support and that friendship, and it's, it's gonna still with me. I'm not packing up my boxes and going off to another church. Although, uh, Jerry said to me, Eric, did you know there's an empty church up the road? So maybe you should think about buying it, which means I need some investors from Lawrence Park here to do that. But no, that's, a, that's a just a little bit of jest. Um, so thank you, all of you, for that trust. Thank you to my friends and colleagues, staff, and of course, to Stephen. And I've kept the best till last. And I'm gonna say to myself, what should that be? Well, it's pretty obvious, and you probably know what I'm gonna say. But throughout my ministry years, and indeed my married life of almost 60 years, I've had the love and support of Marilyn. Marilyn's been part of every church I've served in. And so we've been a bit of a team. And in fact, some of you don't know, but we did five years of team ministry in Hamilton at St. Andrews. And then we really got along for five years. Um, uh, and I think we still get along too, but Marilyn, I love you. You have been my support, my proofreader, You've told me when I should perhaps rethink something or um, get out of the box a little bit. So uh, I'm indebted to you and uh, thank you for all you've done for me in my ministry vocation. So that's all I have to say. You did give me 23 minutes two weeks ago, Stephen. And I was glad you weren't here because you'd probably have said cut it off at 20 minutes or something, but, you know. And, <laughs> And I appreciated the time you gave me that, and you were very warm in your response. I'm not sure your applause because I was leaving or whether there was any content in the sermon, but in any event, uh, you've been most kind, caring, supportive. Look forward to coming back 
and just being one of you and enjoying worship and ministry and lots of fun here at Lawrence Park. Thank you, and God bless you uh, all as you embark on another church year. Um, take it easy, Stephen. Thank take you. it easy. And we have a gift for Eric. Um, <laughs> this is an expression of your thoughts about Eric's time here, uh, collected uh, through one of the kudo uh, things. And I don't know if you got this by email this morning, but here is the book version. Um, Thank you, hey, our Thank pleasure. You. Thank you, Thank and you. Godspeed on your trip, and we look forward to having you back. Now, you may be wondering, how will we survive without Eric? Um, well, we will uh, struggle to get along. Um, Roberta and I will pick up the slack of uh, doing pastoral care. Roberta's hours have been expanded so that she'll be more available to do pastoral care, and I will be doing more pastoral care as well. So you're not being left in the lurch. I can't guarantee that we're going to do it the same way Eric did. And, of course, your relationships with Eric are unique and um, uh, We'll just have to build new bridges with us. So, and of course, we know many of you already. So um, we look forward to listening to you and helping uh, wherever possible. Um, a few other uh, quick announcements. Um, on the 8th and the 11th, I'm going to be doing um, the first of three uh, Bible for Busy Peoples based on my time in Rome. So I was in Rome for three weeks in July, and I went with an express purpose to find and see all the earliest Christian art ever made. And the, most of it's in Rome, it's in the Vatican, it's underground in the catacombs where they buried uh, the first Christian dead, um, and they painted on the walls these wonderful frescoes, um, as that one you can see of Daniel in the lion's den. So I'll do this in three parts. The first one will be about the earliest art, which is the catacombs, and then the second part, which will happen um, in November, will be about sarcophagi, which are those tombs where they carve Bible stories around the tombs. And the final one will be about the very first churches that were built as dedicated church buildings, the basilicas, and those happened in the 300s. And in addition to being fascinating art and often very beautiful, it also tells the story very clearly about how radically, what a radical shift it was to go from the Roman pagan way of looking at the world, which was frankly very violent, um, to the Christian way of looking with that message which we talked about today, where everybody should be equal and everybody should be treated well. That was just an earthquake in Roman society and it's reflected in this art. And I'll show you examples of what the Romans did and then what the Christians did and you'll really be able to see the difference. So I invite you to join us. These will be taking place online They'll, there will always be an evening and a morning version of it, so that if you can't do mornings and you can do an evening, you can do it. And I'll make versions eventually that are, will, can stay on YouTube uh, for a long time so others can uh, learn from this as well. Um, a little bit closer to the present on September 15th, which is next Sunday, we'll have our Welcome Back Barbecue. So I invite you to come. And uh, Judy has told me that um, many people have said, you know what? When it rained in uh, August, it was a drag, but on the other hand, it was kind of nice to be inside because there were no wasps inside. So we're going to do this as a hybrid barbecue where uh, there will be lots of seats in the community hall. We'll keep the doors open so if people do want to eat on the patio, they can, but um, this way it will be fully accessible for everybody and you can stay away from the wasps. And I think that brings us to an end of our um, of our donate of our announcements. I'd just like to say two more things. One, if you'd like to make a donation to the church, we do have a uh, collection plate at the back, or you can um, sign up for monthly donations if you so desire. And we also accept e-transfers. So if this is, you're only going to be here once and you don't have any money in your pockets, you can always send us an e-transfer through our website. And I'd also like to uh, congratulate a few people. Uh, this is actually a busy wedding weekend. Uh, Daniel Jolicoeur and Jamie Harper's daughter Erica got married yesterday at the Donalda Golf Club. I officiated, um, and fortunately it only rained for about a minute or two <laughs> during the wedding ceremony, and I had an umbrella on hand, so everything worked out okay. Um, so it was a lovely wedding, and uh, I know that they're thrilled that Erica's uh, married 
William, who was actually a teacher upstairs at the uh, Toronto Autism School. So um, it was kind of a church wedding in that way. And the reason Roberta's not here today is because Dr. Mimi Norris is getting married today. Um, she's up in Barrie getting married, and she's been a longtime member of our, of our congregation as well. So I congratulate uh, both of those uh, wedding parties. Uh, it's wonderful that people are getting married in this congregation, and we have people who are pregnant who have had babies in this congregation lately. So it's, it's, it's great. It's going to be a really fun year. So let us uh, now uh, sing our final hymn, Let Us Build a House Together. It's from More Voices, but the words will be on the screen. now into this world with kind and tender hearts. Go in peace. The world is waiting. And whatever you do this week, do it with love, remembering that you are followers of Jesus. And may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen.